My talk today is about AI ethics, and we're gonna start with this question, who will be the guardians of AI in the world? And, and a little bit more nuance to this question is to think about it from an institution standpoint, because institutions in this game of governance is really what matters. From an institution basis, um, do we believe that we will ever see, for example, the heavy hand of government and we will have significant global regulation? And so I wanna talk a bit about who some of the actors may be from a governance standpoint. You may be thinking that, well, isn't this government's responsibility? When we think of AI ethics and we think of governance, don't we believe that government should perhaps have a heavy hand in regulation? But history tells us that that's probably not what's going to happen. And I can give you some examples. In China, they famously had a seven year period where the Chinese government said, we were not going to regulate the FinTech apps. And you had companies like WeChat and Alipay develop incredible technology that probably became the best in the world. I believe part of that equation was that the government had a hands off approach. For seven years, they did not want to stifle innovation. Okay, you may be thinking that's China, but what about here in the US? Well, there's actually two examples from the Clinton administration. In 1997, the US government issued a framework for electronic commerce. And within that release, and it's incredible to think about this now, within that release back in 1997, the government said, we don't wanna stifle innovation. We don't wanna impair interstate commerce. We don't wanna burden interstate commerce. So we will let industry self-regulate. Stock market was also up about 400% at the time. President Clinton did it the same thing he did it that next year. In 1998, President Clinton signed the Internet Tax Freedom Act. And that became a moratorium on state and local taxation of the internet. So the president said, we want the internet to flourish. We don't want the states to tax it. I believe that was part of the equation of why emerging technology. If you believe, if you're waiting for government to be the savior and the guardian, that day may never come. What about some other actors? What about NGOs? What about civil society? I think there's way too much commercial potential. There's way too much money at stake for NGOs to realistically control business adoption of technology. Let me ask you this. How do you feel about NGOs that are developing large language models? How is their governance going this past year? Do you trust those enterprises to safeguard humanity? I believe there's a gap. I think there's a gap from government and from NGOs, civil society, and the proposition is that business leaders, board of directors, C-suite need to close that gap. And by business, I don't just mean the five big tech companies. Oftentimes when we think of governance and AI, we think of the five big tech companies developing large language models. I'm talking about the thousands of other companies that are developing, designing, and deploying AI systems. This talk is for you. If you're on the, the board of directors or the C-suite of those organizations, that's where the action is happening now, and we need those organizations to step up. It's not as though businesses are ignoring this situation, though. Businesses are very active. How do most businesses start? They actually start by adopting common, responsible AI principles. They'll adopt the NIST principles, or they'll adopt OECD principles. But the problem is, is that that's where it ends. And those statements will go something like this. We as an organization are against bias and we're against discrimination, and we're for privacy. But it's not very actionable. And we think what's missing is executable, actionable steps that companies can take to promote ethical AI practice. And so uh, be, in order to fill that gap, we developed a framework. This came from uh, the Harvard research team that I lead looking at, well, what is missing and what can we do in order to close this gap. And so develop this framework. We heard from boards of directors and we heard from senior business leaders that they wanted to start with legal mandates. What is legally mandated? Where do we have to start? Tell me what we must 
do. This bottom level, the foundation of the system are non-AI laws. Think about GDPR. Think about in the U.S., the Caremark decision, 1996, Delaware Chancery Court, and the line of cases after Caremark that defines how board of directors need to govern risks. Okay, non-AI law specific. We climb the pyramid. Our next level is AI specific laws. Here, of course, we've got our new EU AI Act. In New York City, there's a law against um, algorithmic discrimination for hiring purposes. There's a myriad of laws that are developing around the country. It's not robust, it's not uniform, but they exist today. And so we believe that if you are leading an organization, you must do these things because you must comply with the law. We're urging companies to go further. Don't just stop at legal compliance. Climb this pyramid and this next layer highlights that there is a series of actions that companies can adopt that are actually good for business and good for the world. They actually protect the company's brands, protect your reputation, maybe even driving short, medium-term profits, and it's also those actions are good for the world. We call that conscious capitalism. An example of well, what may happen at this particular level, imagine that you're using an AI system that's impacting your customers. You have the hand of AI is impacting one of your solutions. Perhaps there's, there's um, a need to be transparent and to tell your customers that the hands of AI has been used in their solution. We think that's an example that's probably good for your business, it's good for your customer relations, and, and imagine if every company did that, that would be good for the world. I was so encouraged. We heard from business that they wanted to do more. And so we developed an even higher level called ethical elevation. There may not be a return on investment for the company, but there's a return for the world. And so when we presented this to a leading ethicist at Harvard, he said, OK, I get it. I like it. But you're missing something. You're missing calling out fundamental human rights. I think about this as if I believe we need a Hippocratic oath for AI first do no harm in the world. And some of this is codified, but some of it isn't. And it's not uniform around the world. It crosses all layers, and we believe we have to call this out. So um, in closing, I'll uh, leave you with three points. Uh, the first is remember the point about the importance of ethics for the business community. Don't think that government and NGOs are going to solve this problem for us. They won't. We need the business community to step up. OK, that's the first. Number two, climb the pyramid. Seek to get to the highest levels. Elevate, even if some of the returns won't produce an ROI for your business, but they'll produce something for the world. That is our obligation, and it's the obligation of a business leader. And then lastly, don't forget about that fundamental human rights band. That's critically important. Fundamental human rights with AI are not codified uniformly around the world. And so it's up to business leaders to think about that. So I'll close with this. If you are a business leader in the thousands of companies that are developing and deploying AI systems, this talk is for you today. Thank you.